We're going to move on to our next session, um, which is about uh, careers in the making, careers at FASS. Um, and so, yeah, we have with us Associate Professor Loy Hui Chia, who is our Vice Dean for External Relations and Student Life, um, as well as Ms. Joan Tay, who is Director from the Center of Future Ready Graduates. Um, and they're going to be taking us through uh, this segment. So, thank you very much. All right, thanks for having stuck through all the very information-heavy session this morning already. Uh, we hope that this session is only about half an hour, will be a little bit more conversational. In the meantime, um, the QR code, the very fancy QR code, uh, uh, is already up on the screen. Can you all see it? Yeah, please, please go ahead and scan it uh, and start to let the questions come in. If you cannot answer them today, don't worry about it. We'll find a way to get the answers to you, okay? And, and even if you, know, you don't hear from us, the fact of the matter is that uh, you're going to have a lot of chances to talk to your career advisors over the next uh, four years as well, right? Okay, so what we're going to do is a quick welcome and overview. Then we're going to do a bit of panel sharing for my two speakers here, guest speakers. Guess? Very strange, huh? you're not guest, guest. <laughs> okay? And then, of course, we hope to do a little bit of Q&A. Let's hope that there's a bit of time for that. Okay? So a quick introduction to uh, team members. Uh, top left, that's me looking well before I got COVID. <laughs> now you're looking at me who just recovered from COVID, actually. <laughs> right? So good to see everyone here. Uh, that, that's me, uh, Prof. Loy, uh, from Philosophy. I'm the Vice Dean for External Relations Human Life, and part of my portfolio is uh, career preparation, employability, that's another way to put it, uh, for our faculty. Associate Prof. Uh, Nicholas Horn, he's uh, away right now. Uh, he's from Psychology, and he helps us oversee, he oversees the student life portfolio, right? So another person to look out for is uh, Dr. Norman. In fact, you'll see him in the very next session on student life. Uh, he also helps us oversee uh, you know, various aspects of our portfolio as well. And uh, we have team members, uh, Wai, Ms. Wang Wai, she's uh, in fact there, right? Please remember this face. Uh, you know, she's wearing masks and spectacles and all that. If you receive an email from Wang Wai, please don't delete it, okay? There could be some important internship opportunity or whatnot hidden in there, okay? And then Ms. Lee Chao Wun, uh, Ms. Beatrice Tan as well, Chao Wun, right? And, uh, Be and Beatrice, are you here? Yeah. Oh, there you are, okay, yeah. Right, so. So all these wonderful ladies work for us in the FASS deanery on the employability portfolio. And later on, you'll see the career campus module. Uh, uh, Beatrice, in fact, is like one of the big uh, sort of masterminds behind the scenes when it comes to all the logistical details as well. Okay? But we also have very important, um, they're not guests, they're, they're, they're just NUS people, right? They're, they're not FASS, but they are our major stakeholders from the Center for Future Ready Graduates. We have, we have very nice, we have uh, Ms. Joan Tay herself, a director of CSG. So she's the big Hei Hon Cho who oversees all the employability and career preparation uh, efforts across the whole of NUS. We also have seven career advisors, uh, Ms. Uh, Jolene Lim. You want to quickly just stand up and uh, each, oh, there you are, okay. <laughs> right. Uh, Mr. Kong Kam Hong, right. Uh, Mr. Lucien Lo. Ms. Uh, Choi Fong Shin, yeah. Ms. Tio Ling Ling, yeah. Mr. Nicholas Lim, and uh, Ms. Rebecca Jo. Right. So there you have it. Seven of them who are tagged to help you in here in FASS across the next uh, four years. So please get to know them. Please, uh, you know, whatever your major is, look out for the one who is tagged to your major and you will see them tagged to your career campus uh, modules as well. Right. Look for them to talk to them, make appointments to see them. Uh, look out for activities that are hosted by them. And definitely, if they send an email to you, usually it's going to be some opportunity or some, uh, some, some things that you can take up. Okay? okay, so I just want to say a few things about the concept behind our career preparation efforts. And uh, the, the, the sort of centerpiece, the backbone of what we want to do is this thing called the four-year uh, roadmap or the four-year career readiness roadmap. Right? And it's instantiated, it's, it's put together as a series of modules that all of you are pre-allocated into. However, please don't get the wrong ideas about what these modules are. Right? You can think of them at one end as a, like a bucket list. You know what a bucket list is? You know what a bucket list is, right? You go to a country, you, know, you get a bucket list, you want to you climb here, you want to jump there, you want to take photos here. That's a bucket list. So likewise, what we've done is we're putting you in these modules in order for us to make sure that you know what the bucket list is in order for you to go through your four years 
and do the kinds of things outside of the classroom, especially, they will make you a career ready person. Right? And these are not things that you need to crash in one semester. These are not things that we would rather that you don't try to squeeze at the end of the semester as if you're studying for an exam. It doesn't really work like that. These are things that you actually want to space out. These are things that you want to pick up as experiences along the way. Right? So, uh, so what we're going to do is that we're allocating these four modules to you across the four years, and in each module, there will be a list of things that you can do, and when you do them, you, know, you get a check mark, and basically, uh, you get a so-called parser of the module. The module is not worth any modular credits. The module will not be, it's not a graduation requirement. Even if you somehow manage to unsatisfactory of our modules, we can't stop you from graduating. But it's a way to check for yourself how are you doing res with respect to the career preparation bucket list. Okay? And then for, for us also to monitor our students to know how they're doing. Are they doing all the things that we think students should be doing across their four years here in order for them to be career ready by the end of the four years? So we also want to know. We also want to be able to follow up with students uh, who are not uh, doing this. So you know, to find out what is it that, that's stopping them, do they need other kinds of help, uh, whether there are other resources that they will appreciate. Okay? Now, so this is how I already said this really. So this is basically a formalized systematic framework to help you, right? But think of them as a bucket list, right? Don't think of them as modules and content for you to master and all that. That's not uh, what they are. The real things that you need to do are indicated inside the modules. There are things, there are workshops you can take, there are experiences that you can have, there are uh, career workshop, uh, career events that you can attend, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are the four modules, and each of them will have a slightly different theme, right? Because in each of the four years, there are slightly different things that you can do to help you become prepared. Obviously, as a first year student, we don't normally say that first year, first semester, go get an internship. I, I think that would be a bit kind of crazy, actually, right? So you just arrived in the country, right? You haven't even gone to a toilet yet. Right? So think about the first thing you want to do in a bucket list. So very likely, what we want to do in the first year, the theme is really, we want you to do the things that will introduce you to the future of work, and then most importantly, to start discovering your career aspirations and interests. And then second year, acquire some essential career skills. They will allow you to excel in internships. Year three, again, to really work more closely with career advisors, because by then, you'll be into your major by quite a bit already. You have clearer ideas about what you really want to do, and then you know, to help you actively apply and seek to secure internships. And then finally, in fourth year, it's almost like closing the last gap, really. Look, developing your final uh, job, search, job search strategies and so on and so forth. So you can see that there are different themes to the bucket list in each of the four years. Okay? And again, I want to emphasize, don't do this as if you're trying to crash it all in the first year or first two years. That's just, it doesn't work, right? It's like going to Paris and saying that I want to uh, you know, climb to the Eiffel Tower and that, you know, that's, that's the only thing I want to do and that's the end of the story. I don't think that's the way to enjoy you know, your, your stay there, right? So likewise, you have four years. Now, one thing I want to note here is that uh, all these things that you want to do, many of them will be outside of the classroom. So they, they need, you need to think of a career preparation, not just as things that you do inside your modules, but as things that go alongside as you study, okay? Okay, so I, I won't go into all these details now because I really want to pass the time to Joan. Let me um, let's make sure that... <coughs> Oh yeah, just look out for the information on Canvas. We're moving from Luminous to Canvas, really. All the very detailed information about the Career Campus modules will be in Canvas itself, okay? Yeah, all this, uh, I'm sure you can see them in Canvas. Wow, yeah, okay. <laughs> Actually, a lot of this, uh, we, I can leave you to say, right? Yeah, maybe instead of uh, going through all these kinds of details, what I want to do is that, are you the ones that you are going to go through all this? Yeah, okay. So let me maybe pass the time to uh, Joan, who will say something to you. Prof. Yeah. Well, it's really good to be able to do this in person because the last two years we have it as a virtual event. So you folks must not take all this for granted. I hope you are taking the time to make new friends and enjoy the interactions. As we were, um, our team were making our way down, I see students leaving the hall or the LT. And so I want to applaud all of you. You should give yourself a pat and also turn to your neighbors to say, you are the discerning one because you stayed on for this session. And this is one of the most important sessions that you must not miss. We are the cool ones, right? I mean, well. 
right? Because some of you may be thinking, hey, I'm just starting as a freshman. Why should I be, you know, thinking about careers and what to do during uh, when I graduate? Because during my fourth year, I'll start early and uh, make sure that I get uh, my full-time role before I graduate. But if that's your mindset, then you are actually one year late because all the top firms, all the um, roles that are in demand, high paying, the employers actually hire through the internship in the third year. So this is one important fact that you're gonna take away that those who did not attend were missed, right? Because this is the world of global recruitment. That's how global recruiters hire. So if you were to go on an internship, perform well, you get an offer in your third year, probably um, after your third year, May to August during a summer vacation, September to October, you probably get um, the full-time offer, the conversion from the internship to a full-time job. But for you to be able to get such a good internship opportunity, you have to then start applying your third year. And for you to start applying your third year to submit all your applications, you need to do the right things in the first two years to build the foundation, to have the skills, to know how to articulate consistently um, what you stand for, what you are good at, why you are a value add, why you are a culture fit to the organizations. So this is why we have to start your career exploration and planning early because employers do take an early approach to hiring. So in your first year, there are just two things to remember. First, you need to know your career advisor, all right, which I'll elaborate later and introduce them later. And then two, you need to enroll for the two MC Career Catalyst because that will give you a sense of how the workplace has evolved, how employers are now hiring the talents, what are some of the resources that you can tap uh, on to build your profile. So let me turn this uh, over this way. Now, as you can see, we are high touch and we are also high tech. So that will give you quite a formidable mix of uh, resources to help you um, forge ahead. So the four year plan is to help you plan ahead when you should go on internship, acquire overseas experience, exchange program. And then you have, besides your career advisor, the career modules also tools. Now, in the career catalyst module, the career advisor will guide you on the, the um, tools and how to register for them. For example, to, um, when you submit your CV um, at the career cat catalyst module, the BMOB will immediately, within three seconds, give you a sense of how you score in terms of format, in terms of language, in terms of personal branding and the impact. So this is important. And then that's where you can work with your career advisor to tweak it and then to continue to build your profile over the next few years as you acquire different experience. And with that, you can actually drop it onto the WhatsApp uh, Career Plus, uh, sorry, the Career Plus uh, app and then with the modules that you have taken, it gives you a visualization of your skills, the kind of skills that you have and some of the adjacent skills associated with it in relation to some of the jobs that you are interested. Then you can see the gaps. Okay, what other skills you need? Then you can take your next three to four years to take the modules to acquire the experience to build the skills. So this is a very useful tool, Career Plus, all right? And if you feel that you do not know what is it like um, to be on a job, you can always use Forage one day in the life of an equities analyst or um, uh, a data uh, mining uh, analyst or cryptocurrency analyst. You can, you can follow that, that virtual experience. And then also take on Git projects through the IAS during your semester. You can work weeknights, weekends to complete a project. In all this, you can put it on your CV. So you build the profile and then apply to Talent Connect for your summer uh, internships and finding your jobs. That's our job portal. And then Connect Us is like the professional networking platform, uh, a car link in for the gated NUS uh, community. So you can reach out to your alumni, to your students to find out, uh, uh, to your peers to find out about causes, to your alumni to find out about the organizations, the role and the industry they work in. More importantly, Connect Us helps you to build your social capital 
to tap into the hidden job market, which research tells us that 70 to 80% of the jobs are found. So you see from the open source on Talent Connect to the hidden job market, we have you covered. So you see the, um, how great it is to know the tools ahead of others. Um, overall, I think FASS graduates do quite well. We have 92% who found employment within six months of graduation. That's based on, uh, on um, the graduate employment survey. So the average gross salary is about 3565 There are some measures that went um, above that in the range of 4000 uh, from geography, um, psychology, um, economics, English literature, etc. Then there are others which are slightly below. That's because of the nature of the work. All right. So this is to help you to make informed decisions so that when you go into a certain industry, you have certain benchmarks. And some of this information will also be shared in the Career Catalyst module. Where do FASS... Oh, thank you. Sorry about that. Where do FASS graduates go? So you can see your seniors have cut their careers in fairly good firms, all right? And there are more. And uh, we give you a sampling of some of the places that uh, your seniors are working. And if you wonder what is Pinkerton, precisely, it is good to find out early, right? Because as of now, you may be clueless where you want to go, what you want to do, but if you start early, then you find yourself having a longer runway with more options. And a lot of these roles, they actually get the priority offer in the third year summer internship. Even uh, for our philosophy graduate who got into a management consulting firm. So philosophy students are good in you know, your critical thinking, reflecting deeply, writing well, positioning, so to you, you will be a good fit for a lot of the consulting firms. Now, overall NUS internship trajectory, you can see hiring is a competitive sport, and internship is really the way to go. So you, as a NUS student, must at least try to gun for two internships, one local and one overseas. That will put you in good state. Uh, as you can see, graduates from FASS who took at least one internship earn a slightly higher average gross salary than those who did not. This information we cut it from the graduate employment survey. And those who did internship, 35% were offered full-time employment. And you can either accept it or if you feel this is not what you want, you can decline, but you use that experience to, to then demonstrate your skills and fit for something that you want. So 10,000 is NUS wide. Within FASS, I think you are probably about 1,005 to 2,000, which is quite a, a good number of students going uh, on the um, internship program on an annual basis. So very competitive, but um, we want to get you ready for the competition. So you need to know to what employers look for. Now, recently LinkedIn did a survey with um, managers, more than 1,002 in the U.S., and asked what are some of the most desirable uh, skills. And these are the six skills that um, they gathered from the survey. And as you can see, they are many soft skills. So in this age of hybrid workplace where we need to use collaborative tools and also all the um, digital platforms, Technical skills are definitely needed. You need to have technical skills, digital literacy. But more importantly, it is the soft skills that matter. The soft skills will differentiate you from being good to great to extraordinary. And what is the top two that uh, they use to evaluate the skills? Most of the, the hiring managers say they ask a behavioral question. Tell us a time when, da 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 da. So this is why we put in place our programs to also guide you in competency-based interview, assessment centers, crack the case, and to all the skills profiling. So Prof. Loy has shared about the HS series, and we had ran it for a year, and we see some of the value add from students who have gone through our HS series. 
right? One, most of them know the career advisors. It's important to have someone who journey with you throughout your four years to guide you, to help you plan strategically, and to also cheer you on. Because it's terrible when you keep sending applications and you don't get a call for interview. And then when you keep going for interview and it does not translate to an offer. So times like this, you have to show resiliency, but we will have support for you and will guide you. Perhaps there's something about your CV that's not getting the attention of the interviewers. And then if you get interviewed but you don't get an offer, then it is your interviewing skills that you need to work on. You need to role play a lot more. But with practice, you get better and better and you will succeed. So the whole idea of this HS series, four year career readiness roadmap, is to give you the access to early success. And as you can see, based on um, one year um, of running this HS series compared to the previous cohort, we have tripled the year one internship participation. So very good. I think your seniors have um, demonstrated very positive role modeling. And attendance have been positive, and then 200% um, increase in coaching. So these are resources that are to, um, given to you. If your peers tell you, ah, oh, there's no need to do, talk to a career advisor, then you're doing yourself a disservice. So now, this is where to, uh, you will know who your career advisors are. All of you are assigned a career advisor. Assuming that you have not declared major, um, I think my career advisor will work with the dean's office to, um, sorry, it went off. That's an important slide. Um, we'll, we'll work with the career, uh, the career advisors will, will work with the dean's office to assign you a group. So take note of the name of your career advisor and the date in which um, they will be engaging you. They will be sending you an email, so don't delete that because um, the email will provide you the details of the first engagement. You can sign up for it. And uh, next will be the way your career advisors communicate with you. Most likely, when they engage you, they will also invite you to join the telegrams. And on the right or on the left, um, you see some of the samples of the messages that they will be sending you through telegrams. You know, the internship uh, opportunity at Oliver Wyman. I have a student who has been there, and then within the first two years, she already had like two rotations. Um, in the emerging markets in ASEAN, one in Vietnam and another in Indonesia. And then there are all these workshops that you do not want to miss because you do need to know what employers look for, how to articulate your, your, your strengths, your, your skills, and the other opportunities. So I think with this, I will hand the time to Kaylee. Yeah, let's hear from one of your seniors. So she's from the first uh, cohort of CHS students. And uh, well, she went through the campus uh, series last year and she did more than that. Um, maybe quickly introduce yourself. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Kelsey. I'm a year two doing political science and linguistics. So maybe after hearing a little bit from Ms. Joan and Prof. Loy, I thought I might share a little bit about my experience in um, CHS and CFG. So I think prior to university and during my first year, there were a lot of pressures surrounding like career aspirations and career preparation. So I think a lot of us can relate to these. Like I would categorize them as external and internal. So external would be like your parents or adults asking you like, what are you going to do in the future? What are you going to do with your degree? Things like that. And obviously they're coming from a good place, but um, they're definitely adding stress for you to start thinking about what you want to do in the future. And then internal pressures would be things like, aside from everybody's expectations, what do I want to pursue? What are some of my skills and strengths? What are some industries and roles that really value those skills and strengths? And of course, they come from a place of fear. So like, um, internships are so competitive. Will I secure an internship, any internship, not just any internship, but something that I'm really interested in and that will further my growth? And of course, um, unfairly comparing myself to my peers. So saying things like, oh, I need to work harder. Like, look at everybody else. I can do better. So I think all these fears and questions really led to the big question of who can I turn to or where can I go for help for career advice. So maybe I'll just share a little bit about the resources and tips that I found helpful. So um, I think my number one resource would be my career advisor, uh, Kam Hong, over here. Yeah, um, basically the, uh, every NUS student has a career advisor and in FAST they're assigned based on their 
um, own career trajectory in their industry. So for example, as a political science student, um, I'm assigned to Kang Hong, who has a lot of experience in the public service. And they're really so knowledgeable about the industry and like they have a lot of industry insights to share and it really helps that they all have experience working in the industries that are related to your major. So I would really, really encourage everybody to go and get to know your career advisors because they're so encouraging and patient and they're always available for a chat. But of course, it takes two hands to clap. So my next piece of advice would be to take the initiative to self-practice. Um, included in the module are things like um, videos for interview tips and VMOC, which is this software that every NUS student can use to refine their resume and even um, conduct mock interviews. So they were really um, helpful in my own self-practice in my own time. And of course, I would revert back to my career advisor for any advice and help. Um, and lastly, I just want to touch a little bit more on motivation and mindset. So I think it's super important to keep yourself motivated and really set aside that time to um, properly fill out your job applications, properly beef up your resume. But of course, it's so easy to fall into that trap of like scrolling LinkedIn at odd hours and like endlessly. Um, I think it's super unhealthy to fall into that trap, obviously. Um, so one thing to take note is that I think it's important for us to all focus on our own paths. There's really no basis of comparison to your peers because everyone starts on a different page. So I think that knowing that really helped take the pressure off for me. Yeah, that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelsey. Yeah, do we have the... Yeah. Okay, so we, we don't really have a lot of time. Um, so I think we should just take some questions. Uh, maybe, you know, let's go ahead and... Uh, you can direct questions uh, to all three of us, actually, because if not, then I'm just going to plant some questions. <laughs> <as kidding. laughs> in fact, uh, maybe while the questions are still coming in... Uh, okay, history. Okay, so I want to say something about, about this, because, okay, I, I wasn't... I'm not a history major person, but once upon a time, I was actually a lot of history modules, actually. I almost became a history major. I think here is something that all of us need to be very aware of as FASS people. Most of us don't do things in jobs that are literally what we study, right? Uh, I, I, this is a real story. I was in LTA, uh, with a whole bunch of NUS uh, people to negotiate some internships, and the guy was going on about how he needed 30 civil engineers next year. I turned to my fellow vice dean from engineering and said, no one has ever asked me for 30 historians in one shot before. <laughs> right, okay? right, so this is how it works. But guess what? Our history people are working in media companies, doing research, they are working in corporations, they are in consultancies, they are in banks, they are in government, and they are using the skills they learn in what they study. And more importantly, they are there as interesting people. Second story, talking to someone, uh, this is, what's the name, uh, the one for, a chemical engineering person who became a asset management a CEO that you guys brought in for. Shinling. Yeah, Shinling, right? So, so I asked her, why do you hire FASS people at all? And she said, oh, because you are more interesting. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, so because, you know, you know, every day it's finance people around me. At the end of the day, say, enough, enough, right? And I want to hear someone else talk about something else, like poetry or whatever it is, right? You know? <laughs> no, so this is a serious thing. So my advice is, if you study X thinking that I must only do job X, you're in trouble. There are very few jobs that are like that. Okay? But if you are open-minded and you're saying that, I, I want to explore all these different industries. You know, I may be studying history, but yeah, it's okay. Media, I know how to do historical research. And they're going to need that too. And I'm going there, and I'm the interesting one. Okay? You actually have some experience in the sense, right? Political science, it's not as if you are literally like, yeah. doing political science in your job now, right? I mean, as a year one, you have very little technical expertise to offer anyways, but it's more about how you're being trained to think in your majors that you're applying to your internships and eventually your career. Yeah, that's right. Um, how about, okay, how can I get an internship in year one and overseas? In the, Joe, maybe you want to say something about that. Yeah. Well, you just have to apply, right? <laughs> so first thing first, <laughs> if you want an internship, you need to know what are the internships that are available and then you have to apply for them. But I suggest you go beyond just the job title and look at the skills. Because as I shared, uh, employers go beyond just the field of study, the degree, and they look at the skills. 
So at face value, history may not seem as great value as someone doing computing, but um, a degree in STEM doesn't guarantee that you will get uh, good internships if you're not able to work with people, if you're not able to relate to um, others in a collaborative way, if you're not able to make sense, connect the dots, come up with solutions, you're proactive um, in uh, helping your teammates uh, work on a project. So these are the, the qualities that employers look for. So if you have these qualities, then you need to articulate them and then put it into a narrative that, um, that helps you uh, convince the interviewer that uh, you can take this internship. So internship um, could be done through, as I said, the internship as a service platform or also through um, your summer internships. There are a lot of year ones who have successfully secured internship. I think last year we have more than 200 plus year ones, right? Ling Ling, yeah. Okay. okay, just one small one and then we will wrap up. Jobs uh, for post, I'll just give you one small <laughs> one. The, the, the guy who runs Copcoms in Citibank in Singapore is an FASS political science alum. Okay. Just to give you a sense, they are everywhere, mm -hmm. right? If you go to, if you tell me that, or if, I used to ask students, what do you want to study Paul Science? Oh, because I want to go to MFA. Well, Bilahari has some choice words for you because he's not going to hire you, <laughs> okay? So study something because you love it. It makes you an interesting person. It makes you the kind of people that people say that, yeah, this one is serious about thinking about the human condition, okay? And we hire the person because he's smart, she's smart, and she's interesting. Right, because he or she make an effort to understand our ministry. That's why you want to be. Okay, use your skills that you learn in your school, in your, your modules, but in a way that is relevant to people who are not just other people who are doing your major. Okay, um, clinical psychology, I would say, right to psychology department directly, because that's actually a very, very specific pathway for a very small minority of people. Okay, okay I think that's all the time we have. Please keep the questions coming. Don't worry about it. We'll figure out a way to get the answers to you across the span of the next four years. Thanks for seeing all. Thanks for seeing. Good to see all of you here. Okay, thank you very much, um, Prof. Loy, uh, uh, Ms. Joan Tay, as well as Kelsey.